I needed a remote to control my Acrobot, so I built this universal remote controller. It has a bunch of input features such as uh, keypads, a joystick, encoder, and even some sliders on the side. And also a bunch of output features such as an LCD screen, there's a little buzzer inside, and a status LED. I learned a lot whilst making this, so I wanted to share with you my 10 tips for making such a remote. The first six are things I wish I'd done differently myself, and the last four tips are actually things that I tried and I'm really happy with, so stay around for those. And of course, many of these tips will apply to any edX products project, so I'm sure you'll learn something new that is useful to you. And now let's get on with tip number one. So my first tip is if you can, don't build a remote at all. Try and buy one off the shelf and modify it to your needs. Of course, if you have fun buying remotes, be my guest, but it will save you a lot of time and effort and also money to just buy something off the shelf. And even if you can't interface with this, uh, for example, this is a USB remote, you don't know how to read this out, you can still try and wire up all the switches and the potential meters of the joysticks to something like an Arduino or an ESP that you put inside and it will still be a lot easier than building something from scratch. And just a part of this already cost me like 40 euros, but then there's always things like I needed a tiny screw over here for these sliders and it turns out that you cannot buy these individuals, so I need to buy a whole pack for 15 euros and these costs add up plus shipping every time you make a little mistake, you buy one part new and you need to pay shipping for it. This ends up being quite an expensive project. Whereas one of these you can pick up for 10, 20 euros, I think, and then you just take it apart, you solder on your little controller board and you're basically done. But in my case, I couldn't do this because I needed sliders for my project and I wanted the big LCD screen. But maybe for your project, there might be something on the market that's already similar enough to uh, suit your needs. Tip number two is about the enclosure. If you can, consider 3D printing it or laser cutting it rather than building it out of a food container like I did. I thought building it out of a food container was going to save me time, otherwise I would have to model a box in 3D. But instead, it did cost me a lot of pain. All these square holes, for example for the LCD screen and for the little switch, they are terribly difficult to make. And this material is polycarbonate and it cracks very easily. And then I had a lot of efforts to make these sliders work. Had I had mostly had round holes, like for, for just simple buttons, it might have worked fine. But in the end, I wish I would have taken the time to 3D model a custom box uh, and 3D printed it instead. Tip number three is about joystick mounting. These joysticks, they are designed to be mounted uh, somewhere on the bottom. I mounted them to the top, to the surface that they're also protruding through. And I need to get standoffs at uh, just the right size to be able to make it to work. But even then still, because there are screws on the top, you can't freely rotate it. You kind of have to go over the bumps of these screws, which is not ideal. And I couldn't put the fourth standoff because the fourth standoff is grinding against the joystick and didn't allow it to move freely. So they're definitely designed to be mounted on the bottom side. I like it that it's on the top now because that means that I have most of my electronics contained on the top. And of course with a food container like mine it would have been way too deep had I put it on the bottom of my enclosure. But if you can, try and mount it on the bottom of a thing and that would have been much easier had I 3D printed a box instead. Tip number four, count your connections carefully. I needed nine analog pins, uh, four for the sliders, four for the joysticks and one for the battery. The ESP32 that I'm using has 16 analog to digital converter pins, so I figured that would be plenty, but it turns out that you can only use six of them if you're using Wi-Fi or ESP now on it, which I am, because I'm using it for wireless data. So in the end I had to put a little extra analog to digital converter to allow me to use the joystick in this case. Speaking of an analog to digital converter, this is one that runs on I squared C and it's called the ADS1115. If you happen to also be using the ADS1115, make sure to dive a bit deeper in how it works and how the libraries work because it turns out it's very, very slow if you use it with the default settings. It took me 40 milliseconds to read all the four inputs and this was originally some blocking code that slowed down everything by a lot. So avoid that by diving into how the library works and diving into how the ADS works. There's an alert pin that will send you a signal when it's ready to be read in case you want to. Tip number six. My bottom sliders are longer than my top sliders. I needed to shorten the bottom one so that the sliders would be the same height. Don't be an idiot like me and try and grind it off with an angle grinder because then you heat up the tip and I ended up destroying my slider. And afterwards, I discovered you can much easier shorten them and much safer, of course, by just using a pair of pincers. 
And now we get to four more tips of things that I think that did go well in my project. For example, this was the first time I switched to using DuPont connectors for everything. I invested in a crimping tool and a bunch of connectors and it is the best thing in the world. You should definitely do this. Before I was using all these prototype boards I would solder to and I would make my own custom connector by having this female socket here and using these header pin solder to little cables to be able to make connectors. And often this would get accidental shorts or it would really break really easily. It was not ideal at all. So now instead there are no uh, prototype boards whatsoever. It's all just uh, DuPont connectors directly on the pin headers. For example here on the ESP I connect them all to rather large connectors so I can don't need to plug in so much and also they sit much more stable than if you have individual connectors. And to connect the ground and uh, the voltage I have these these group connectors. There was an idea that came from Andreas Spies, the YouTuber. So this is one female socket that has the ground that all the others can connect into. And this works really, really great. So also for connecting the top and the bottom half of my remote, I just have one connector over here. I need to watch for the same orientation because you can plug them in two way rounds, but I used color coding to make sure that's easy. And then we're done. And this has so far worked without fail. I'm really happy with these DuPont connectors. Tip number eight is putting a little buzzer inside of your remote. I wasn't sure whether I should do this at first, but I'm so glad that I did. It's been so useful for debugging and testing. For example, I set it to make a little noise when I spin the encoder. And of course you can do all of that with an LED too, but I'm already using this for other things. And best of all, I don't need to watch it to be able to get the feedback. For example, the issue with the analog to digital converter that was being slow, I would have never discovered that without using this, this little buzzer. Tip number nine is using ESP Now for wireless communication. I consider Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, but ESP Now really is just the simplest if you're communicating between two ESPs. So this will make a connection to the ESP that will later be in the robot. And I only need to input the MAC address of the receiver to be able to send a package of data at a very high rate over a very large distance. For example, if I plug this now into a power bank, then immediately you'll see the red LED turn blue suggesting that the packages are being received and when I remove it again, it will turn red. This wireless connection was very easy. I'm very glad that I chose this protocol and I can highly recommend it if you're using multiple ESPs. And tip number 10 is to use an ESP with an integrated battery circuit. So this comes with a battery holder and a battery charger so that I can just charge it over USB. I can't recommend this particular version because the first one I had blew up the battery and I'm still working out with the supplier what actually went wrong. But the idea of having a battery and your ESP together and that you don't need to get a separated battery charger and that you don't need to get a separate cable has been really convenient. So I just need to plug this into USB and I can use it both for connecting data and for charging the battery and it's been really, really easy to make it into a remote standalone thingy. So these are my 10 tips on how to build a remote. I hope that this way I can share what I learn in a way that is useful to you. And if you want to see more of this, Please subscribe because I will be working from now on more on the robot itself. This is the old version. I'm building a new version of this robot that can do acrobatics with me. It's called the Acrobot. And uh, yeah, so subscribe, like, uh, leave a comment below if you have tips on how I should change stuff or do something in the future. I'd love to hear from you. And otherwise, have fun building, making, watching, doing, playing and see you around. Bye bye.